Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. Welcome to our third installment of the Ask Us Anything panel, AEC panel discussion presented by CAD Microsystems. So a little bit about CAD Microsystems. Uh, you probably know us as the people who sell you your software, but we're also a full service consulting firm. Uh, we provide training, help desk support, consulting, all focus on the design, build, operate industry. We have a team of industry recognized experts, several of whom are on this webinar with you today, and they are published authors, registered architects, engineers, construction experts. They're top rated speakers at Autodesk University and Built. So a wide array of knowledge and experience. Our customers call us when they're frustrated uh, with their design processes and technology and wanna improve them, make them more efficient, add new capabilities, win more work, stay competitive. All of those are things that we can help you with. We take an educational approach uh, to solving your challenges. We're laser focused on helping achieve everyone's business objectives and business outcomes. And it's why we're presenting this today to help you, especially during this um, very interesting time we're in. So my name is TJ Meehan. I'm the Vice President of Technology Solutions here at CAD Microsystems. I've been in the industry over 25 years um, and I'm very focused on, on BIM and the BIM process, whether that applies to designers or contractors or owners. I've been um, a speaker at many different conferences over the years. I was last year's president of the AIA Northern Virginia chapter. And beyond that, I love, as you can see, things with Lego, with Excel spreadsheets. I do believe Excel can save the world when handled correctly. Um, and of course, great food, too much of which I've partaken in during this uh, nine months stuck at home. It's another story. With me today, I have Jason Kunkel. He's our senior practice manager. He's also has 25 years of experience in our industry. Um, he has a very interesting background because obviously he's an architect, but then he moved over into the IT realm. So he has a huge skill set and a wide array of knowledge. Um, very good speaker, excellent radio voice, as you'll hear. Um, and he's presented all over the world, in fact. I'm also joined by Marissa. She is our practice manager for infrastructure. She's our civil 3D, map 3D, land desktop, GIS expert. Um, she's a certified professional and instructor for Autodesk, AutoCAD, Bluebeam. And she also has 25 years of experience. We have a lot of experience on this team. We added it up the other day. It was over 300 years of experience for our small group. Next joining us today is is Pervy. Pervy is a licensed architect. She's our practice manager for architecture. She's an Autodesk Expert Elite, which is a very difficult certification to get. Um, and she has more than 15 years of experience in the industry. That number may be higher. I guess we have the plus now. With her, we have Chris Lindo. So Chris Lindo um, is, is one of our consultants. He's a certified um, in Revit, in AutoCAD, in Bluebeam, top-rated speaker. He is he is our resident Bluebeam expert, and we have a few Bluebeam questions we're going to address today. His many years, over a decade of years in the ex of experience in our industry, and then rounding out our team today is Eden. Eden is our CAD Care program manager. CAD Care is our certified help desk program. Um, she's has an um, tons of experience in tech support and in leading tech support teams. But really her superpower is the new single sign-on onboarding and named user transitions. So she is your one-stop shop when it comes to dealing with all of the licensing changes that have been coming down the pike with Autodesk products. So how's this gonna work today? So all of our experts are here, we're all on camera, we're here ready to answer your questions. You can add your questions right into the chat panel in, in GoToWebinar. So feel free to type those in at any time. If we run out of time, we will get back to you. We will address those questions. We're gonna try and tackle as many as we can in the time we have. I think it's only slotted for a half an hour, but we tend to run over on these. 
If you have to jump out after half an hour, again, we'll follow up with you if you throw your questions in there. And of course, we're recording this. So you'll get a link tomorrow, the next day to um, be able to access the recording in case you need to step out. Okay, with all of that, let me switch over to this here. Here's our team. And we already have a few questions. In fact, we had a question come in while we were getting ready. You probably saw us chatting on our cameras there. So from Jason, he sent a question over saying, having not used BIM 360 much, what are the pros and cons of live model linking within the same firm and with outside firms versus publish and consume? So I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Chris and Chris is gonna give you, um, do his best to take an answer on that. Chris, do you need the screen? Uh, no, I don't need the screen. I can okay. just talk a little bit about it. So um, for those who might not be aware of uh, what BIN 360 is, BIN 360 allows a lot of processes that you already perform inside Revit, inside Navisworks, inside uh, even AutoCAD and some other kind of capabilities, uh, just kind of pushing it up to the cloud. And one of the great things about Revit is that you can link in uh, models. So you can go through what's called live linking, right? Being able to link in a live model that someone else is working on. So when they make changes and synchronize the central, then you get those changes when you synchronize the central. Now, live linking and uh, and going through the uh, uh, publishing and consuming processes inside BIN 360 both have their pros and cons. Really, uh, live linking is best done, in my opinion, uh, more in-house, right? Because then when something happens or something goes wrong, right, we could just look over the, uh, the cubicle or these days maybe just type in uh, uh, Teams or, or Skype or what have you. Uh, to, to resolve that issue. And it's a little bit harder when we have uh, separated firms. So I actually recommend the publishing consuming for outside firms. And that's when uh, you have a lot more control over what updates happen and at what point does that update take place during a submittal process, right? Say an architecture firm's already on the ball, they already got their, their submittal done, and someone wants to go further beyond that and start adding in different doors or different, different kinds of uh, offices and things like that when they make those updates if you live link and you're not quite ready for that submittal yet then you get that update right so that publishing consuming really helps kind of bridge that uh, uh or sorry make a uh, make a temporary bridge if you will so you can open it and close it when you need to wonderful thank you chris and uh, i will say in my opinion chris has the best ugly holiday sweater today because his is actually usable outside of this silly environment. So kudos to you, my friend. I'm going to do a follow-up question. Um, this is going to be for Pervy. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Pervy. The question here is um, also related to BIM 360, which is I've saved my Revit model in BIM 360, but I can't see the latest changes online. Yeah. So so this happens a lot. Oops, sorry, move this over here. Uh, when you know folks are like, "Oh, I saved them. Why is it not syncing properly?" Now, this this does touch on what Chris just said um, a little bit. Now, when you work when you work in BIM 360 in Revit, it does save your changes, but it doesn't actually push them out for others to be able to see them online. What you have to do is you actually have to uh, publish your model. So if you can see, you can see my Revit screen here. This is kind of that home screen. You go over here to BIM 360, you browse to your model, and you'll see your models here. And if they have changes that have not been published, you'll see right here where it says updates available. And all you need to do is you go over here to these three little dots and you can hit publish latest. So that's one way that you can do it. Uh, another way is if you actually have the model open, you can go over here to where it says manage cloud models under the collaborate tab. Okay, and you click on that and it'll pop up a screen. It sometimes takes a little minute. It'll show you all of the projects that you have available to you. You'll click on your project and then it will bring up a screen that shows you all of the different models that you have inside of that project. It always takes a little second. Um, and then from here, you can also actually publish it too. So if you see all these models, these are the three models that I actually have that are part of this project. And if I hover over here, you're gonna see two little icons one that looks like a little paper with an arrow, and then this one 
um, if you see that little box with an arrow, that means that it's not published. If I hover over this one and you see a little green check mark, that means that these ones are the latest ones that are online. So I can also do it from here. Um, now, one other cool feature is let's say that you uh, are working internally and you have a few different models that are linked together, like you're doing a multi-story residential, so you might have a units model and a base building model, and you're working in both of them and you just want to um, publish them all together. If you go over here, this button up here is actually the publish all button and it will allow you to publish all of the models that are in the project together at once. So that can be another quick way to do it. Um, now from experience, this will do it and you know the other way will do it. The sort of the most efficient way is actually from here and this is the one that kind of works the best in real time. So if you need it right away, I would do it this way. And then you go into BIM 360 and you'll see it spinning the little publish and you'll know that it's going and then it will change the version number and when it's done, you'll know that it's ready. So there you go. Awesome, thank you. Okay, next question is from Brian. And I'm gonna start this, I'm gonna turn it over to Jason really quick to start this. Well, I'm gonna Give me, I'm gonna grab my screen back here. Or Pervy, if you wanna show it back to me. I got it. So the question from Brian is, what is your favorite approach or tool for keeping current on Autodesk's multiple forums as they continue to add new um, new ones? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of information out there and, and you're absolutely right. Just things keep getting added. Like I think, um, uh, the big room was the most recent kind of big push they're doing for the ACS stuff. Um, so that's another place we can go and 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 watch and monitor. Um, there's a couple routes I I do externally. Um, you know the the Autodesk forums themselves, the management. And I was trying to log in right now and and see where it is. You know on the management page itself, you can actually su su subscribe to certain keywords to get notified of that. Um, you know I, I tried to kind of go in there every day. There's a lot of it's a lot of white noise in the forums that that frankly is a little little just a lot to, to parse through that may not be necessary so um subscribing under your profile in the forums themselves for certain keywords beyond that what i'd like to do is let other people kind of filter out the stuff for me um i'm on more on the revit side so you know there's a bunch of different revit blogs i like to follow i like to aggregate them with um uh, uh flipboard i think is what i'm using on my iphone uh, but like Steve Stafford's got a great blog, uh, Revit Op Ed. There's uh, What Revit Wants. Um, Revit Kid um, is another great um, blog that kind of helps cut through the noise and really pull out front um, what's new and what's critical and kind of that information. Um, Dan Stein's got a fantastic blog that, to, to follow there. Um, and then something that's popped up very recently, especially over the quarantine time, is there's been an explosion. I mean, explosion like four or five but an explosion essentially of kind of new uh, podcasts and video podcasts that tackle these as well. Um, I know for me personally, I'm not driving as much, so I'm not listening to as many podcasts, but those are new opportunities that you can subscribe to those. And again, let other people kind of narrow down and parse out the critical and important uh, new information and high information. So in terms of monitoring the forums, uh, I think my number one tip is to let other people monitor the forums for you and then uh, pick up the pieces from there. So Eden, I think you had some um, you wanted to add to this as well. Yeah, I saw this one um, come in and I thought it was maybe a good time to just kind of uh, inform everyone of some cool CAD care stuff that's coming out. And CAD care is, of course, our, our help desk and our support. Um, but also just to tack on to what Jason was mentioning in terms of external links and stuff. Uh, keep an eye on the blogs, the official product blogs, especially the BIM 360 release note one. It's a, a great place to kind of get updates and things like that and see, you know, any any kind of critical information that might be good to be passed without having to go and search through all those multiple forums. It's a good um, influx of info in there. And then uh, CAD Care also has a newsletter coming out within the next couple months here. And that's kind of going to be like our goal is to aggregate all of this information that's spread out all over the web and provide it um, to those folks who use our help desk services as a benefit. Um, and just, you know, kind of look through that stuff for you, um, do the do the thinking for you in terms of where to go, what to find and um, what might be important to know. And uh, also just a way to keep an uh, update on the 
product versions that are coming out, hot fixes, things like that. It's all going to be in one spot, and that's uh, something we're really excited about. So I just wanted to share that. Um, thought you might be interested. Very cool. All right, let's switch gears. I'm going to throw it over to Marissa now, and there's a, a question for her related to Civil 3D, which is, I'm using the intersection wiz wizard to create three-way intersections, but it keeps messing up. It's like it thinks there should be a fourth road. Why is this happening? Sorry, there we go. I couldn't find my mute button there. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, this can happen sometimes when you actually have two alignments that are not quite meeting up the way you think they do. If there is the slightest overlap between you know the the main road and then the one coming into it, if there is the slightest teeniest itty bittiest overlap, it's going to count that as a fourth you know incoming outgoing road. So this happens on uh, roundabouts as well. So you want to be super careful. Make sure when you if you're having this issue, go back, take a look into your alignments, and make sure that they are actually meeting up cleanly. Because again, any undershoot. Or, I'm sorry, any any time where it's going to cross even by the tiniest bit, it will think and try to do its own, you know, fourth portion of your intersection. So always check that first <clears throat> because that really might solve the problem immediately. All right. Excellent. So, Eden, I'm going to throw it back to you really quick. So there's a question that came in that essentially says, people getting stuck in the trial loop. Can you explain that and talk about how that how that works? Uh, okay, people getting stuck in the trial loop. I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, assume this is like a named user transition thing. That's where I see it the most. Um, so there's, there's a few different things that you want to make sure of. Uh, one is just to reset your licensing. One, check that you're signed in. The biggest thing is to check that you're signed in and that, you know, it's actually pointing to your new license. Um, two, you know, you might want to have your admin, uh, double check with your admin, make sure that they've assigned you the license to whatever software it is that you're stuck in a trial loop for. Those are going to be like the number one things to check. Um, especially, you know, if you're getting something that's saying like, you don't have access to this product or, you know, you don't have a license, here's how you can buy one. Anytime you see that buy one screen, um, it, it's, it's pretty indicative of the fact that you're missing an entitlement. So just check in with your admin, make sure everything is okay and that you're, um, added to the the account and that you have the software assigned. Sometimes though it goes beyond that. Sometimes you can get like stuck in a trial loop where you know no matter what you do, you sign in, you get kicked right back. Um, you can't find the way to go to manage the license because the you know the um, program might shut down if you're beyond what would be the trial period. So ways to do that would be just to reset the license manually. If you can't get into the software right up where it says sign in, you can actually go to manage license and change it from there. But if you can't get in, you're going to have to manually do it. Um, and in that case, I would point you towards our blog for one, because our blog has a write-up by Michael, who is also in our help desk team, for how to change or reset licenses the easy way. And that's uh, from the administrative level, where somebody can you know, remote in and reset everything for you. Or you can do it as well. There's a link on there that goes to Autodesk's direct um, blog and the things that I usually find work for me are the manual ones. So if your software doesn't start that part of the link, uh, and what I'll do is I will send two links to, um, to Kelly and Allison for them to publish for you guys. So if you ever do run into this issue or like you're saying, you're experiencing it with different users, um, just try this, run this on their machines and I will, uh, include the parts for both 2020 and previous versions as well. So that, that's, that's all the stuff I would check. That's the rundown. Awesome. Thank you. Let's throw this over to Pervy then. Here's a question from, from Karen. Um, it, it's a Dynamo question. So I've been using instance parameters like length to change values on adaptive components, but I tried it on a normalized curve parameter. It tested fine in Revit. It gave an error message in Dynamo. So Pervy, what insight do you have on a question like that? 
Yeah, so um, thank you for submitting this question in advance. We actually pushed it over to our Dynamo expert who unfortunately can join us on this call today. And so I have his response, um, which is more about general troubleshooting than the specific error, but hopefully that helps you. And if not, again, you can follow up with us afterwards and we can connect you to someone who can, to our Dynamo expert who can help you with that. But what, what he said is that, um, first, you have to determine whether it's a warning or an error, and most often it's actually a warning. Um, and when it is a, uh, in it, but if it's an error, then the node will turn red and then the script won't work. Um, if it's a warning, one or more nodes will actually turn yellow and then the message will be displayed above the node uh, that can be expanded. So you find the first node that's in the series that has a warning and expand it, and that normally provides some sort of um, insight. Uh, if it's not really that obvious, you might have to search the dynamobim.org forum for the warning message. Um, try it. She said try searching with and without the name of the node with the warning uh, to help you determine the solution. And pay attention to if it's an out-of-the-box node or if it's from a package because that'll make a difference, you know, as to the support for it. Um, and then if it came from a package and you can't actually find the answer in the forum, he said go ahead and actually create a new post and try to tackle tackle the actual developer. He said, you know, folks are pretty active on the forums, and so you'll usually get someone who will respond to help you. So I hope that helps a little bit with just general troubleshooting. Excellent, thank you, Pervy. Um, yeah, if you have more Dynamo questions, please send them our way. Um, we do have. Uh, several Dynamo experts that can help you with that. We also teach several Dynamo classes, um, or you could do one-on-one -on -one with one of our experts to learn even more advanced techniques. So we have lots of opportunities, um, lots of resources when you're working with Dynamo. So let's move forward then. I'm gonna throw this over to Chris. We had one who just came in um, from Lauren about Bluebeam, and, and Lauren asks, our agency has had numerous errors in working with Bluebeam 2020. It locks up our computers, doesn't open, gives us error messages when attempting to mark up plans. Any ideas or any other folks experiencing these issues? Um, so that's, that's a good question. question. Uh, I had some, some folks that, that, um, uh -oh. Oh, that. Hold on. Is anybody else hearing robot Chris versus uh -oh. actual human Chris? It's more like I a Cylon, but yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, Chris, I'm going to I'm going to come back to you with that one. Uh, Marissa, let me throw it over to you really quick. Um, there was a question about zooming extents in Civil 3D. Do you want to show your screen? Um, actually, I, I do not have a, a sample that would allow me to show okay. that, but I can I can talk to it. Um, let me just, actually I'll go ahead and share my screen um, just to point to one or two things. So if you could hand me the presenter, that would be great. Hold on one second. All right. You're faster than me. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. Yep. Okay. All right, so let me show this. Now I have seen this issue happen quite a bit um, and this usually stems from having sites in your drawing that are not being used by anything or they're older sites or they were sites that were referenced in from another drawing somehow because um, they came over with something that was even copy and pasted so there's lots of different reasons why the sites would be doing this um, so the sites are here on the on the prospector tab of the tool space and they're right here now if you have sites and they've got things on them you're fine but like i said sometimes when they're empty or they came in another way and got corrupted maybe this whole drawing was inserted as a block then what's happening is you're seeing what's called the site parcel, which is a site always has a parcel that goes sort of all the way around the extents of everything inside of that site. But if there's nothing in there, if there was and it got removed or things like that, a lot of times a tiny little itty bitty site parcel will be placed all the way the heck down at zero zero. And if you were to zoom in at zero zero, you'd be able to see it. Now, if you are not quite sure where the zero is zero is and you don't want to try and guess your sort of level you you can use a the uh, quick select and that should allow you to say hey just select the parcels and you'll be able to zoom right to that and you'll be able to see that hey there's something here and if you just erase those 
um, it's not going to work. You actually need to go in and into here and you need to get rid of the sites that are causing the problem. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Marissa. I'm mm -hmm. going to throw it back over to Chris. Just to remind everyone that the question was, you know, issues with Bluebeam 2020 locking up, error messages, things like that. So, Chris, see if you're back. Yeah, yeah, my mic is better, better now. No, no. Uh, Maybe I'll have you disconnect and reconnect. Yeah, Let me yeah. go over to Jason. Um, this is a really good question. It's one we get all the time, which is, how do I make suggestions to Autodesk on how to improve their products? How do I know where their products are headed? How do I have any insight into what's happening with them? So Jason, yeah. I'm gonna throw that over to you. Awesome, yeah, this is this is definitely a, a great question. There's kind of three different places to pay attention to most of this stuff. The, the primary question was about offering feedback um, to uh, AutoS there. And TJ, I sent you a couple of URLs to pull up. I know my sharing is a little, little goofy. Am I? Um, oh, I'm not sharing right now, am I? I still see me. Civil 3D and it's, it's giving me heart palpitations, but. <laughs> there we go. Love you, Marissa. All right, so the first one we've got here is the Autodesk Ideas page. This is kind of the first place to go if you've got an idea of how to improve the software. Um, almost every title, definitely the big titles are gonna have their own ideas page. And this is a subset of the forum. And all you do is you go in here, you kind of do a quick search to make sure nobody else had your idea. If they did, you can you can thumbs it up, you can vote for it, or you can offer some feedback into it. Um, but if nobody has supplied this idea, this this um, it's not a wish list, but this is like this is how to improve. This is what I think you should do. Um, you can generate and submit your own idea on this page to uh, allow other people to review, uh, not just Autodesk people, the whole community to review, to comment on, to refine, to give feedback to. Um, and then the Autodesk developers monitor this, kind of look for trends, see what's online with other things they may be doing, and then they build off of this. Uh, and we certainly get the question, does this actually get paid attention to? Um, and to kind of keep track of that, there's another page you can go to for some of the, the products have roadmaps. This is the recently updated Revit roadmap. Um, they went to a Trello board system, um, and I know a, a lot of us even on this panel have submitted some ideas before. Um, I'm, I, I, it, it feels like a giant nerd win, um, but one of the ideas that I submitted is actually now on this tro on the roadmap. And it's like, once you find out, you're like really excited and you tell your mom and dad and they have no idea what you're talking about and you're a little embarrassed. Um, but if you look under, um, if you look under any of these, if you click on them, if, they're, if they were provided as an idea, if you open up one of the boards, it will actually point back to the idea page that was the first impetus for this. So you can still go back and comment, you can still go back and vote, um, but this is kind of a more focused place to look about what they're working on and to start help give feedback on as they're developing. Um, the third one, I didn't send you the link, TJ, but if you just wanna to go to feedback.autos.com, uh, um, this is kind of the third place to kind of stick your 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 hand in the process and get things going. This is the beta page for Autodesk products. Um, you create an account. You kind of talk about what software you're interested in. Some of the some of the beta programs are completely wide open and anybody can get in. Other ones you have to get invited to, depending on your interest and depending on how much they need. But this is where you actually go then, and you get that pre-release access to software where you you are literally kicking the tires before it comes out and you say, no, no, this doesn't work quite right, or no, no, I would like it if it does this. Um, and once you're in here, this of course is the most direct input on a, on a, on a very small refined list of features, obviously, because they are actively developing it. So, so again, if we're going from feedback wise, if we're going big to little, the first one is that Revit Ideas page, or the Ideas page in general. Um, the second place is gonna be to watch the roadmaps and feedback there. And then the third place where you get the most input but on the least functionality is going to be on um, that beta page. So, TJ, I don't know if this is under NDA for what you're actually looking at there. Okay. Well, yeah. Sure. I think anybody Perfect. can sign up for the Revit preview, though. That, yeah, maybe. I don't. I'm not sure how that works. So, th those are the th three spots I'd go to. And again, it's it's a yeah. it's a big fun win when they take your ideas Amazon, and you tell. Yeah. Just be careful who you tell um, that that you got an idea when. Awesome. 
Okay, let's see. We have some other things here. Pervy. So here's a really good question for you. I'm going to make you the presenter. Awesome. All right. Do you have any general best practices for working with downloaded Revit content? Oh, downloaded Revit content. So, yeah, so this is one I get all the time. So we say, you know, we find so many places online that we can find content. And some places are obviously more reputable than other places. Uh, you know, manufacturers do it. There's these aggregator websites. One's called BIM Object. Another one's called BIM Smith. They uh, have manufacturers, you know, pay to have their content put there. Um, and then, you know, there's just forums that you can download things. So just like anything on the internet, uh, you want to always take it with a grain of salt, right? You're never going to never ever just download a piece of content and put it directly in your project. I like to say that, you know, doing that is like dropping a bowl of glitter. Like you're never going to be able to find where all the things that were in that piece of content have infiltrated into your model. You know, it'll stick in line styles and object styles and line patterns and, you know, materials and just all sorts of things. So I actually wrote this blog post earlier in the year because in the one week I actually had three different clients be like, can you teach us how to do this? So I said, you know what, this makes sense. So um, we're going to go ahead and stick the link to this in our, uh, in the chat. But it's it just goes through and sort of tells you like start here and see how I'm very uh, very direct here. Do not do this. Um, and it kind of just talks you through how where to look, what to find, what to clean out as you're going through. Uh, because if you download a piece of content and it's more than you know a meg, you want to be careful because every time you add that in, it's going to add that amount to the size of your model. And you know the size of your model affects the performance of your model. So you just want to be careful with that too. It's it's really about protecting your model, making sure that you're not putting junk in there that is hard to get out later. Um, and then, you know, making sure that your model stays lean and mean, right? If you're doing a, you know, 3,000 square foot house, that's a small Revit model. You know, it's not a small house, but it's a small Revit model. Or if versus if you're doing like a 50 story multi-unit residential project, you're going to approach them a little bit differently and you're going to think about that content a little bit differently, but it's always good to have that same philosophy of making things clean and not putting things in your model that you don't really need. So I would check out this um, and then of course send us any follow-up that you have related to it. So I'm cool. gonna push it back to you, TJ. Thank you. So um, we, we're at our time for this. We're gonna continue moving forward though because we have a few more questions to answer. But if you have to jump off, we understand. Thank you very much for joining us today. Like I said, we'll send out um, a follow-up email um, with a link to this recording so that you have it. And I should also say, you know, if you have questions about how we could help, you know, there are lots of different ways we could do that with, with education, with installations, with helping you on your own projects, with building content. All of those are things that that we can help. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll contact you and, and talk you through it. Okay, let's jump back in. We have some more questions in here. All right, we're gonna try Chris again. Chris, let's go back to that question about the errors with Bluebeam. Yeah, can, can you hear me now? All right, success. All right, fantastic, great, okay. So uh, that's a really great question. Uh, so following back up with the errors with uh, with Bluebeam crashing uh, and maybe freezing up, especially if you're working in PDFs, uh, one of the big things to remember is that PDFs are still uh, um, a file that you must manage, right? So a file can be very, very large, right? So I do recommend that if you have a very large file set, to break it up. It's just best practice to kind of break it up as best as you can uh, for uh, for you as well. Um, another thing to remember, or, or sorry, to, to keep in mind is that since 2019, Bluebeam Review has been now relying more on your GPU, that's your graphics card processing uh, a unit, uh, so you can actually start to use your graphics card to process and render your PDFs. That's a fancy way of saying that it's no longer re really relying on the software or the RAM to, uh, to process these PDFs, it's actually more relying on your graphics card. So it's actually really useful in that way. Unfortunately, the ones that are experiencing the most issues either have a graphics card that is not supported or their graphics card driver is uh, out of date, okay? 
So first things first, make sure that your software is up to date, make sure that your product, uh, sorry, your uh, graphics card uh, driver is up to date. And if that still doesn't work, you can still always go back to the legacy software. If you go to uh, go up to review, go to preferences, there's a little tab on the left-hand side that will say advanced, go there. You can change your uh, 2D and 3D rendering settings from hardware to software, and uh, then just reboot the software and, uh, and see if that works for you. That's my best advice. Those are really good um, things that they can try. And of course, if um, this, question was from Lauren. If if you continue to have problems, reach out to us, reach out to our help desk with, with Eden and um, her team can help you get this resolved. Chris, I'm gonna keep you on the spot for a second because we had a related question. I'm gonna um I'm gonna pull out part of that question here, which is the one of our customers, Renee, had a Bluebeam project deleted. And is it possible to recover those files? And do we get reports of this happening? That's a great question. Um, so, uh, so if the Bluebeam project deleted, that might be someone accidentally, instead of uh, just removing the project from their list, because you could do that as a single user, uh, maybe they were an admin and they ac accidentally deleted the, uh, the, the project. I believe that Bluebeam does keep an uh, ongoing archive of those projects up to six months. So you can uh, contact Bluebeam and see if they can get it back for you. Okay, but that's going to be on their side since they're in charge of the cloud. Now, I believe inside, uh, if you if you get if you have Bluebeam uh, Studio Prime, I believe that you also have access to the back end archiving in Bluebeam Studio. But if you don't have Prime, you're going to have to contact Bluebeam, and we could certainly do that for you as well. So Chris, Renee had other um, parts to her question. I'm gonna mark that for follow-up so you can contact Renee and, and find out more about what's going on and see if we can help out. Oh, more than happy to. So I can let's add switch a back over to, like, TJ. what's that? I could add a little bit to that as well, if you'd oh, like. Oh, good, yes, please. Um, yeah, I can confirm for you. I think this is for Renee, right? Uh, yeah, I can confirm that I, I've not had any um, incoming issues with Salesforce. Um, so if it's something where the Bluebeam like project was actually deleted or the files were deleted, um, if you do, like Chris was saying, have uh, sessions, then go to studio.bluebeam.com. You might be able to find an archive of it. Um, and you might, if you, it depends on like really how your file is missing too. But if you do see any version of it, um, you can check your revision history for any old versions of it. And you might be able to restore from that point as well. So kind of requires a little bit more investigation and I would um, I would encourage maybe to uh, to open up a help desk case with this one so we can kind of take a look into it more further with Chris as well but yeah try those two options try try logging into um, studio.bluebeam.com see if you have a file you can recover there or a previous version and and no I haven't heard of this happening very often so okay excellent thank you so Pervy I'm going to throw it over to you I'm going to make you the presenter here um, we have another question that came in. So is there a way for me to share my models with someone who doesn't have BIM 360, like an owner or a consultant who's not working in it? Um, yeah, and this is actually a really good question because I was just, this works out really well because I just showed this to a client yesterday. So I have it all kind of ready to go because it takes a little time to process. Um, so there's this feature that was just added, I think over the summer. Um, which is called Shared Views. And it's available in 21. It might be available in 20, I'm not sure, but it's not available in 19. Um, inside of your, so here I have a cloud model open and under the Collaborate tab, there's this little button over here that says Shared Views. So if you click on that, it actually opens up this little panel and you can take a 3D view so, and you just hit this new shared view button and it will ask you to name it and all this stuff. I'm not going to do it because it takes about five minutes to process, but I have this shared view that I created. All right. Now, a couple of things, you can set an expiration date on it, which is great. Um, and if you, when you want to share it, you just go over here to the three little dots and there's different ways that you can share it. You can view it in the browser, you can copy the link. This little extend just extends the period that it's uh, available to whoever you share it to, or you can delete the shared view. So if you click this view in browser button, I'm going to go ahead and do that. It's going to take me to my browser and it's going to open it in what's called Autodesk Viewer. So anyone can view a file in Autodesk Viewer as long as they have an Autodesk account. 
All right. You don't have to have Vin360. You just have to have an Autodesk account uh, to be able to do this. So then I have, here's that view, and I have all of these navigation buttons down here at the bottom. So I can orbit around it. You know, um, I can cut sections if I want to. Let's say I want to cut, you know, this way, and I can adjust the planes, um, things like that. And then I can actually add comments. So let's say that I zoom in over here, and I want to ask, add a comment about something. I go over here to this comments panel, right? And it, it zooms in on that little piece. It makes like a little screenshot, you know, and I can do the comment and I hit post, okay? And it posts that comment. And then the really cool thing is, is if I go back here into Revit and I hit this little refresh button, okay? Now it says four comments. And if I open it, I can actually see all of the comments that were made here and I can reply to them, I can resolve them. So it's a really great way to communicate with those who aren't, familiar with Revit. So not just external, but even in your own office, if you want to send it to the principal or, you know, someone who's not, who doesn't know Revit and doesn't necessarily have a BIM360 account, uh, you can use this to share it with them. So, and this is a relatively new thing that was just added about six months ago. So. Pervy, I'm going to keep you there for a second because we had okay. a question come in from Heather. Um, so I think you have a little insight on this. Is there a way to verify what is the origin point in a cl point cloud file? We recently received a point cloud file that we tried to insert into both Revit and AutoCAD, and the insert point was defaulting the center of the point cloud. And Chris, you may have some insight on this as well. Yeah, so I did a quick search just to kind of better understand the question, and I found this post um, from not too long ago about point clouds and kind of talks about how to do the positioning. Um, so I think this might be your best bet to review this and see if you find anything in here that helps you. Um, I don't specifically have any knowledge. Maybe Chris could jump in if he has some uh, to specifically answer Heather's question. So um, <clears throat> I do have a little bit of uh, uh, insight to it. So it depends on the kind of processing uh, uh, application that you're using. I know that you can use uh, Autodesk Recap. And with Autodesk Recap, you can actually change around the origin um to meet where you want it to be you can just essentially just kind of move around the ucs uh when you need to um there then you can uh specify the uh the actual um point that you want to use so i know a lot of people use survey markers that can be part of the uh the actual point cloud uh that's done in recap outside of rec uh, uh recap there's uh Faro and leica i know that you can specify the origin point uh in that file so usually you're gonna want to utilize that in in the uh in the actual processing application so when you get a point cloud you can process it into Faro or leica or even recap uh and then take it and put it into uh, into revit um revit just has a hard time understanding other coordinate systems other than its own so really when you specify the coordinate system inside uh inside your uh your point cloud model you basically have to understand how Revit is going to read that, right? It's not going to read it as shared coordinates. It might read it as a zero, 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 right? X, Y, and Z. So I would suggest setting that up in the in in the recap model, or sorry, in the uh, in the point cloud model, setting up the zero, zero, defining what that is, and then relating that to Revit. I wanted to point out to add to Chris that if you have the AEC collection, Recap Pro is one of those products that come with it. So you may you may already own Recap that he was talking about to be able to manipulate those point clouds before you bring them into Revit. And to add on to that too, so Recap uh, will be able to read many different kinds of point cloud models. So it could be you know from a Leica, from a Faro, from uh, they have another uh, file type X Y Z things like that. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to move forward here, Jason. We haven't been able to pick on you enough today. So I'm gonna throw a question to you from Daniel. More and more of our clients are working in Revit and sharing models with us. And Daniel works in the manufacturing industry. Our team creates custom floor designs, some of which can be hundreds of feet wide and long, manufactured in the tens, hundreds, and thousands of pieces, then assembled in the field to be seamless. I assume he's talking about raised floors. How can we get these designs into models for visualization, qualification, construction, subdividing floor surfaces has proven particularly difficult in previous attempts. 
Yeah, so I'm making some assumption here. I was assuming raised floors as well, or even just some sort of maybe like an athletic flooring system overlay on top of a slab or something. Um, so I, I would go two routes with these guesses for raised floors. I would build a component system. Um, you might be able to do a panelized system, use one of the panel systems that is already inside of Revit. Um, you know, make it basically um, um, the curtain systems, just do it flat. Um, you can't really leverage what's already made there. On the other hand, if we're talking about just kind of adding a like a tile-based system over top of an architectural or a structural floor, this opens up a little bit into the history of Revit with the API. When Revit first came out, there was no API. Like you could not write software for it. They said, there's not going to be one. And then all of a sudden, there was one. Um, as new features were being added to Revit, those were being included in the API as well. For some reason, for a very long time, um, there was no API access to sketch-based elements like floors or ceilings or roofs. So you could not uh, write an application that could automatically place flooring, which is where my head goes with this system. If you need to like, if you want to just draft out sketch lines and say, these sketch lines are the perimeter of my floor, automatically make my floors. Um, the good news is, we refer back even just to the um, roadmap we were talking about, that is on the roadmap now. So they are opening up the API access to allow sketch-based systems to be programmed for. So um, without knowing your needs specifically, um, and we talked about our Dynamo expert before, but even with Dynamo or with just straight up um, application development for an add-in, I think with the new API functionality that should hopefully be released either the next version um, or even a point release, you could probably have somebody write a custom application pretty pretty effectively that will let you just kind of sketch perimeter, pick a floor, and then it will build all those individual floors on top of kind of the poured slab floor. Um, not the perfect solution right now, because honestly right now the only route to do is, go is just be manually draw every one of those floors individually. You can select existing sketch lines and, and click, but it's still a manual process. Um, but yeah, I, I think if we had this chat 12 months from now, um, I'd have a much better answer be like, oh yeah, we can automate that, no problem whatsoever. So not perfect now, but hopefully some hope on the horizon. And of course, when, when Jason means somebody could build that for you, he means us, we can build you whatever custom software yeah. you need. Um, we're very good at it. In fact, Autodesk hires us to build some of their software that you may have used. So we only have three questions left. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Chris. A uh, quick question. Do contractors need to purchase Bluebeam in order to see or interact with our plan view review markups? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, no. <laughs> They can uh, they can get actually the free trial of uh, Bluebeam Review and they can let that trial lapse if they want to, uh, and uh, then after that point they can still uh, uh, use it as a PDF viewer. But what I would recommend is that you would create what's called a Bluebeam Studio project or Studio session. That way you can interact with them in real time and they still don't need the uh, full version of Bluebeam Review or pay for a license of Bluebeam Review. But one thing I will say is that uh, once they try out Bluebeam Review, either in that 30 days or going right into studio sessions, they're probably gonna wanna buy it anyways. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn the screen over to you, Chris, to do our next one, which is a quick one. How do I combine a PDF using Bluebeam Review? Awesome. So uh, so with, uh, with Bluebeam Review, a lot of times people get uh, PDFs that might be divided up into several different kinds of documents and then you can combine them later on. Now, when you combine them, you're not actually going to be overriding the original document. So that's really fun to, to do as well. So up here in uh, in file, you just go from file to combine, right? And then you can select your set, right? So here are all my individual PDFs. I can highlight them all and bring them all in, open them up. And then also too, I can take uh, any of the sheets that I might want it to be first. I could just move these up uh, in the uh, in the queue here so that they are the first few pages, right? And then I have some other options like including bookmarks, use file name as page label, things like that. I do recommend to do this because especially if they named it uh, exactly what the uh, sheet actually shows, this is going to be very useful for you, especially inside Bluebeam Review. 
Once I'm done, I can click on OK. It very quickly combines it all, OK? And then now I have a brand new document with all of my pages here associated to it, OK? Now, not only do I have this, I can also create bookmarks from those page labels. So a lot of times people don't really like the thumbnails here. They'll just come right over here to bookmarks. You see that I don't have bookmarks here. Well, the page labels were created. I can just create bookmarks from page labels. There we go, right? So really just combining these PDFs can really save me a ton of time. And again, they do not overwrite the original documents, okay? So uh, you can always keep the uh, the original documents as an archive copy, but then when you're combining these, you can kind of make it your own and, and change it around as you need to. Also, if you uh, mark these drawings up and then you have to resubmit as separate drawings, you can still select all of them, right? Right click, you can extract the pages, extract pages as separate files, use the page label to name those files, and now you have a whole brand new set of PDFs that are now individual files. All right, excellent. So we have one more question we're gonna talk about today. Oh, it's already on my screen. There we go. Excellent. Uh, one last question that came in earlier that I'm gonna talk about and then we'll wrap up here. Um, it's, a, it's a long question, it's about owners. I'm gonna kind of hit it at a high level and then I can follow up with this person. But essentially they asked, and owners decided to create a bare bones Revit file for each of their buildings on their campus. They're also requiring the AE and construction contractors to provide their work in Revit and deliver as built models in Revit. The owner then has an internal team to incorporate these as-built Revit models into their essentially master file, if it were their as-built, such that the, the building Revit file gets improved and updated continuously. Based on the above scenario, what is your input and recommendation for this owner? So we see this more and more, and I, and I spend a lot of time actually working with owners and helping them implement a, a Revit process let's talk about it from a high level and why it's so great um you know the beauty of revit is i can have a very minimal number of files to have essentially digital twins of my entire campus and and the way it works is that unlike cad files where you have to create separate files for different floors and different disciplines because only one person can work on a file at a time when it comes to revit you can have more than one person work on a revit model and in this scenario, what happens is that the owner has this one master model that is their as-built model of their building. And they have, you know, of course, multiple buildings in their campus. But let's say a renovation project happens in this building. They essentially select the elements that may be part of that, that renovation and put them on a work set. And then what they can do is actually give the, the outside contractor, architect, engineer, um, GC, they can give them a model that has these these elements that they think are going to be part of the renovation, copied and pasted into it, and then link in the rest of the master model. So now they have control over all these pieces. Um, the rest of the models linked in for reference and context, and then the master model has those pieces locked out, so everybody knows there's a renovation project going on there. The architect engineer can make all their changes, do their design revisions go all the way through construction, update the as-built, and all those pieces now can be copied, put back in, and replace what was in there. And by managing that through work sets, everyone knows that all what projects are going on and what project manager is in charge of them and what the project number is. And so if they have a renovation project right next to it, they can coordinate with that project manager to figure out who's gonna edit what, because that object's gonna have to be edited in the real world as well. So that's the overall scenario. We've, we've helped many owners implement that scenario. We can help um, this owner implement, and I'll follow up with you so we can talk more about that. With that, we got through all of our questions today. So if you want to reach back out to us, we have lots of different ways of doing that. We have email, we have LinkedIn, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, um, we have our YouTube channel. All of those are ways that you can reach out to us if you have any questions, want um, to talk to us more, find out the services we can help you with. Otherwise, I'm going to end it there. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate it, and we hope to see you again very soon.